your end. I so. I see it says live. Yep. So. Now we're going live. All right. It is the Jew 23 Community Podcast. It's clarity for those who are curious or confused by all things Christian. I am Jeremiah Wood along with Nick Hardcastle. And this is what? Episode like 17, 18? Seven, I think it's 18. 17. Is it? Okay. 18 it is. Yeah. So I'm looking. I don't know if we are quite live yet. Um, because, oh, there we are. We popped up. Yeah, it popped All up. Right. We're a few seconds behind, but everything looks good on, on this end. Awesome. Um, yeah. So, was- all right. Well, thanks. If you're joining us tonight, uh, this is our first time uh, playing with the live stream. So we are broadcasting live uh, on YouTube, and we are also simultaneously broadcasting live on um, on Facebook, on my personal Facebook page. Uh, Nick, I, I guess if you would go on your Facebook page, you could share the live feed. Uh, and maybe if you wanted to share it on your Facebook, um, yeah. Hey, man, people yeah. are liking it already. That's fantastic. Wow. There Let's we go. Can... Hold on. Time out. Time out. Go back. Uh, what the? Go away. All right. Did you hear any of that? <laughs> I, I had the, the I had the video playing and uh, trying to talk. So anyway, we are getting this figured out. Um, I don't know if there's a way for me to be able to monitor it. Uh, but listen to this. If, if you're on YouTube or if you are on Facebook and you are watching this right now, um, give us a couple of test runs. Uh, make some comments in the comments. Um, they will come through our streaming software. Uh, Nick, are you able to see the comments on your end? We haven't Matt, gotten it yet, but is there a spot that says comments on your end? Uh, I, I have not. Oh, let's see here. I've got a StreamYard comment it says join the chat, but I just think that's just StreamYard. We'll mm, give it a okay. try. Oh, I can connect it to YouTube on there at least. So we're going to connect you to go. YouTube. Sweet. I haven't been on Facebook in a while, so <clears throat> I'm trying to trying to get the app pulled up. Yeah, not a problem. Not yeah. a problem at all. Well, let's not worry about it. And yeah. let's go ahead and... We know we're live on both YouTube and on Facebook, so let's just go ahead and rock and roll. So, we are in Genesis chapter 14. If you remember anything from last week, if you've seen our episode from last week, we were talking about Abram and how Abram had to go rescue his nephew Lot. Uh, Lot was drawn close to the city and eventually drawn into the city. And then when warring neighbors or warring kingdoms Uh, came and attacked, they took Lot and all of his family and all of his possessions as collateral damage along with the city. And so Abram uh, gathered his people and he went and rescued Lot. And when he rescued Lot, he came back. And as he brought back uh, Lot and his family and all of the plunder that was lost from the city of Sodom, um, he meets this man named Melchizedek. So uh, we are picking up in chapter 14, starting in verse 17, and we'll go from there. Nick, I see your comments. It says, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. I gave it a test. So perfect. Yeah. We got five viewers. If anybody has a question, they are coming through on our end. So uh, we're here to answer any questions about the text. We might not have the best answer, but we're going to give it a shot. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be good. Nick, why don't you read from us uh, Genesis 14, 17 through the end of the chapter? Okay. All right. Genesis 14, verses 17 through the end of the chapter. After his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave a tenth of everything. 
And the king of Saddam said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Saddam, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and of earth, that I would not be that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and share of the men who went with me. Let Aner, Eshkel, and Mamre take their share. All right. That's good. That's good. Um, let's start out with this. After Abram returned from defeating, uh, from defeat, Chedor Lemur, Lemur, Le, Leomer, uh, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. So let me give you a couple of things about Melchizedek that we talked a little bit about last week which I thought was really interesting, is his name means, Melchizedek means, my king is righteousness. Yep. And one of the other translations that I looked at said that my king is the God of righteousness. So um, this idea of Sadek, um, and if anybody wants to do a word study later on or dive deeper into this, this idea of Sadek um, is where we get other Hebrew words like tzedakah and things like that. It all has to do with justice. It all has to do with um, righteousness and right living and right being. And so Melchizedek's name literally means my king is the God of righteousness. And he is the king of Salem. Salem is uh, Hebrew for the word peace. And it is also where... Uh, that location will eventually become what, Nick? Jerusalem. That's right. Jeru Salem, which also means you will know peace. And so this whole idea of Melchizedek is, is really just kind of this introduction to a promise um, that God is uh, kind of giving. It's the beginning of a promise that God is giving to his people, and it is wrapped up in all of these names that my king is the God of righteousness, and through him you will know peace. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of the introdu introduction to Melchizedek. Yeah. One thing that I, I was looking at my, uh, what is this, archaeological study NIV Bible, which they haven't produced in a little while. I think it's been replaced with the uh, cultural background study Bible. There's a good footnote in there about Melchizedek, uh, really about Canaan at that point in time. It said, in the ancient times, the chief Canaanite deity was referred to as Most High, or Lord of Heaven and Creator of Earth. Uh, but based upon the terminology and the location, Melchizedek was probably a Canaanite king-priest. Um, so really, uh, this wouldn't have been you know, we will we'll get a little bit more into it, but I think what we're seeing is really a couple of different things coming to light here. Number one, uh, we, we got to talk about the king of Sodom, because uh, honestly, he's in his own little vein. I mean, he's a little bit a uh, little bit uh, in a different vein of light of what we commonly talk about when we talk about Melchizedek. But we see Melchizedek honor a blessing uh, and it's really a blessing that would be culturally appropriate i guess for his people saying you know blessed be god most high uh, and i think mm -hmm. the the really important and unique thing in there is abram takes that and extrapolates on it even further on he says you know blessed is yahweh or blessed is the lord most high um so he's even saying that it's not just that there is a god most high saying there's only one god most high but i know mm -hmm. jeremiah yeah. as you're kind of walking into this story um, we see a couple of different kings on the scene and uh, there's a lot to dive into about Melchizedek uh, further on and I guess into the New Testament and some extrapolation that we have about him. But, you know, what else is really sticking out to you in this story right now? Well, one of the things that I learned growing up and um, specifically when I was a young adult, I was in a church and um, the pastor there, he was he was very good at, at teaching us the uh, the scripture. So shout out to Milton Hubbard 
for uh, his excellent teaching. And as he would, he would walk through this story, it seemed like he would walk through this story at least once a year. It probably wasn't that often, but it felt like it was that often, but it could have just felt that way because it was new and fresh to me. But this idea of Melchizedek, uh, like you said, it, it covers, um, it, it starts out in mystery, right? It's kind of shrouded in this mystery uh, of who is this guy? Why is he all of a sudden there in the story? And so if all you had was the Torah and the Old Testament, that was about all you would get. Um, but Melchizedek shows back up later in Psalms 110. And Psalms 110 is actually a prophecy um, for the Messiah. And if you look at Psalm 110, verse 4, it says this, The Lord has sworn both and will not take it back. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And so we um, continue into the New Testament, which makes things even more um, mysterious. Uh, but we start to see a little bit about how the the New Testament offers uh, authors how they kind of viewed um, Melchizedek, uh, and especially in light of who they were claiming Christ to be. So in Hebrews chapter seven, uh, actually in chapter six, uh, verse twenty, it says this: that Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner, because. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, um, chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, he was king of Salem. He was priest of God Most High, uh, who met Abraham and blessed him. As he returned from defeating the kings, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means the king of righteousness, or my king is righteousness. Uh, then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Uh, verse 3, he is without mother, he is without father, he is without genealogy, and he has neither a beginning of days nor an end of life, but he resembles the Son of God. So the New Testament authors are now contributing into this mystery, right? So we have, we have three parts. We have the original story in Genesis 14. We have the prophecy in Psalms, and now we have the New Testament author in Hebrew, in Hebrews, saying Jesus himself is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, just like it said in Psalms, just like it says in Genesis. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's lots of different rabbit holes we can go down with that and uh for in, anybody also that's watching uh watching this people are popping in and out i see a couple off and on there uh we're in genesis chapter 14 verses 17 through uh end of the chapter there so if anybody's popping up and on and wanting to figure out where we're at just fyi uh that's where we're at right now and what we're talking about but uh, I was listening to something on this the other day that was super interesting uh it was as well on the Bible project and what this, it wasn't specifically on Melchizedek, what they were talking about. I'm sure they have something great on Melchizedek in there, but what they were saying is that if you take this story of Abraham or Abram, you actually see uh, a really a repetition of what would be uh, Genesis uh, chapter one through Genesis uh, chapter I think nine just playing over and over again in there. It's kind of like a loop. Like it's, mm. there's three different ways that it repeats the kind of Genesis uh, creation story all the way through the blessing in there. And if you were to kind of play that out, uh, you can mark it with some key things to where there's like a large amount of destruction, like a flood in there. Or similarly with what we just got off on there, there was a large war that was happening at the beginning of this chapter. So there is a large war, uh, there's destruction that happens. And after that, it's followed by um, a blessing. Um, and really, if we are looking at this, we're kind of in a unique story right here. The way that it plays out in my mind is that if, if that is true and we're seeing kind of the, 
the original Genesis story being played out more over and over through Abraham's or Abram's life, one of the things that stands out to me is that Abram finishes this uh, conquest of Melchizedek. Essentially, you've had this war, and then um, he goes and conquers the uh, king Chedorlaomer or whatever. But then he goes and he gives a tenth of everything that he has to Melchizedek, which is yeah. kind of is similar to like Noah coming off the ark and giving a blessing. So I think what it, hmm. which there's lots of things we could kind of dig into that, and hopefully, uh, maybe one day we'll get into a little bit more. But what it shows me is that. Uh, Abram is actually learning a little bit more about himself and how he can trust God's story in the entirety of this, because not only does he uh, get over this, you know, conquest and get through this really tough time, but he says, I will give to those who are around me. I will bless those who are around me and I don't need to hold anything back for myself. Yeah. Let's ask a couple of really interesting questions about Melchizedek. Um, in all of this, um, number one, uh, how is it that Melchizedek and Abram uh, worship the same God? Like that seems like an interesting question, right? And I know yeah. your your uh, what is it your archa archaeological background study. archaeological yeah. bi- background study Bible. Uh, it says that Melchizedek was worshiping a different God. Um, well, it it says that at that point in time, the Canaanite deity who was of like the most supreme power was referenced as the God Most High. So, I I mean the the way that I actually read this story, whenever you read Melchizedek's blessing in verse nineteen and twenty, um, Melchizedek just says, uh, "Blessed be Abram by God Most High." possessor of heaven and earth blessed be god most high who has delivered you but abram takes that and repeats it a little bit later on and he says in verse 22 abram said to the king of sodom i have lifted up my hand to the lord god most high possessor of heaven and earth so abram takes that blessing and he actually interjects the name of god into the middle of it Mm. so really good I, I don't know this in myself. I mean, I, I'm happy to be wrong, but I think that, um, Melchizedek saw Abram and he said, this guy just took like 300 people and he defeated 10,000 people with them. Whoever this guy's God is, he is the God most high. Like I'm throwing in with him. Like I rep, I, I recognize his God is the supreme being because he delivered him from this situation. So, I mean, that's the way that I read it. Happy to be wrong. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Jeremiah? It's a, it's a, a really good question that is really important for the story. Right. Well, I'm looking back at, um, I'm going through my blue letter Bible right now, uh, and looking how, Yeah, so the the word that or the the term that um, Melchizedek uses for God is El uh, Elyon, uh, which is God Most High. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're right. Uh, there's a there's that it's a subtle difference, and I I, I think that if you weren't uh, aware of it and weren't looking for it, you would miss it. Right? You would miss it completely. That Abraham was. Uh, it was almost as if Melchizedek was, um, and, and let me let me make sure I'm phrasing this correctly. Mm-hmm. I still think that Melchizedek and Abram were worshiping the same God, was still worshiping uh, the Lord Most High. Mm-hmm. I think from what you just said, that Abram actually gave that... Uh, the Lord Most High, the the name, right? The Lord yeah. God Most High. And so it's kind of like, uh, and this may not be a very good comparison, but it kind of reminds me of how Paul was in um, Corinth and he goes up to Mars Hill and he says, uh, you know, 
you have a, a statue here to the unknown God. Let me tell you who that God's name is. So if I hear you correctly, that's what uh, you feel like Abram is doing is saying, okay, you're blessing me with God, the Lord, uh, God most high. Let me tell you who that God is. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. Yeah. He is Jehovah. And I, I think really just kind of extrapolating off of that and some of the foundation of it that pops up in my mind is if you go back to the creation story, it says God created, God created, God created over and over again. Um, and it's not until after that creation is completely done um, and um, later on, it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made earth and the heavens. So in the middle of that, that's the first time in the entire story of the Bible where the Lord introduces his name. He creates the entirety of the earth, gets done with that, and doesn't introduce his name until after. So until really after the creation is done, he introduces himself to us. So if we kind of extrapolate that to the uh, situation we talk about with the unknown God, I think there's probably um, many different times in culture where maybe people aren't introduced to, you know, to the Lord, and they actually can sit there and say, they, they understand that something is holding it in together. They're like there's some sort of being that has to be able to do this because it's bigger than them. Um, and then they, they can recognize that in others. And it's really just what Abram's doing is, is taking it one step further and he's introducing him to who this God is, who this Lord is. And he does it in a very similar way. He, he does it by, by giving, by an act of charity. He gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Um, just, just for his, like, honestly, I think recognizing that the Lord is, is good. This God that you're following mm -hmm. is good. Um, and, but he also makes sure that he shows that, uh, his God is for righteousness, um, and will sustain him without it. So I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's an interesting question that unfortunately I wish we had more than, you know, seven verses to understand this understand it about right well what's interesting to me is that, that uh it seems that melchizedek uh probably has knowledge of who god yeah. is uh, but does not have the personal connection that abram has uh, with the lord and so obviously it seems like melchizedek is probably a descendant of uh several generations specifically from noah and mm -hmm. uh, one of noah's sons and so as uh, a descendant, again, it, it, it seems like he probably knows, uh, not, has knowledge of who the Lord is, um, but doesn't know him personally or know him by name. And it's almost as if Abram's introducing him to him. Yeah. And I mean, really, I think that plays out super well because we're talking about someone who was, I guess, a Canaanite king at that point in time. So there's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, a big extrapolation of how these came because you know they they all are descending back to noah but when these people were spread out um they still had a, a something in them to help them recognize that you know god's in the universe and holding this together but i don't know you had a couple of other questions it sounded like what other what other questions or thoughts were popping out to you jeremiah for this story well, one of the things that I learned when I was younger was that Melchizedek is kind of an archetype of who Christ will be. And we kind of read that a little bit in, um, in uh, Hebrews chapter 7. And if you wanted to study Hebrews chapter 7 a little bit more, you can go back and read that. But one of the things that um, really kind of stood out, especially from like a New Testament perspective, is why, why did Melchizedek bring a feast of bread and wine. Like why bread and wine? I don't know. <laughs> I don't either, but it screams, um, you know, last supper to me. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's, it screams last supper, but also, um, if we are kind of thinking about this in relation to Israel, 
they wouldn't be thinking about a last supper here. So I, I also no. kind of wonder if you unpack it from their perspective is they had feast of bread and wine to show that there is celebration um, after these type of events. And yeah. that celebration should be done um, in community, in community with uh, other people and with the Lord. So I don't, I don't know. It's a tough one to unpack here. Right. Yeah. But let's think back about who the original audience is, right? Like this is yeah. Genesis traditionally is credited by being written by Moses. Moses is writing to the Israelites on Sinai who just came out of slavery from Egypt, right? And so mm -hmm. when we see this priest, uh, Melchizedek, uh, the, the uh, king of righteousness and the king of peace, um, and he brings this bread and he brings this wine. Uh, this almost looks like uh, Passover imagery, a Passover that the Israelites yeah. just recently experienced not too long ago uh, in their own story. And so uh, maybe this was a way that allowed the Israelites to see God at work even greater in the story, that that it wasn't Abram and his super... Um, you know, superhuman fighting skills. He didn't have superpowers. He was a man who uh, lived in a tent and he had some people and uh, he went from there. Um, and so this idea of Melchizedek showing up with bread and wine, pointing back to the Passover saying it was not in his own power. It was the Lord. Yeah. And I think if we really just take it back to the fact that God's trying to unpack something to his original audience with this right here, the, the Passover really is something that really, that screams kind of at you with this, but you would have seen that original audience have to go through a lot of these tests, um, you know, war and everything like that. But I think God's maybe just trying to understand and sit there and say, if you trust the story, there's going to be the party there's going to be the communion that you get to all partake in. Um, right. But you just have to rely on me to sustain you. And when you do that, I think that you're actually learning to walk step by step with the Lord. So, yeah, yeah. the, the bread and wine is super unique. The one thing that stands out to me is you were talking about a bunch of names last week. Um, what was the name or what was the king of Sodom's name? I don't remember oh, if you man. have that all pulled up. Let me see if I have my notes still. Uh, yeah, Just, it was like the son of iniquity or something like that. Yeah. And I think that the other thing is here, we've talked a lot about Melchizedek, um, but there's two, well, I guess there's, you know, multiple characters in this story. Um, but whenever we're talking about an Abram, or an Abraham story. Um, everything's kind of just like Abram is the primary character in the story and everybody else is kind of just a background character unless it's God. God right. would be the only other primary characters in there. Um, but what we've kind of been talking about is one particular person. We've been talking about how he was, uh, you know, uh, in charge of, or a, a king of peace. Um, he was a uh, representative of God most high, but there's another King that's presented in this story here and he's already showed up. It's the King of Saddam. So mm -hmm. do you have what his name meant just to keep everything going? Yeah. Which one was he? He was, uh, better. Um, it was either, I'm trying to look. Yeah. Bar uh, Barah, King of Sodom. His name means son of evil. Yeah, son of evil. So, and we had Melchizedek, what, and his name was translated to what? Was it Jeremiah? King of righteousness. Uh, king of righteousness. So we have kind of two opposed forces right here in the middle of the story. We have a son of evil and mm. a king of righteousness. Yeah. Um, which it's it's a really good parallel in here because you know God is building up on the fact that there's there's two ways to go about in this story. You can either trust it and you can. Uh, throw in with righteousness or you can line up and be in with the son of evil. Who's got a, a bit different agenda. Um, yeah. But in the end of it, it it's kind of unique because all this happened. Um, the King of Saddam was beaded by, or was defeated by Chetelaramer, uh, 
before I guess this little section of Genesis chapter 14 uh, started, but he just immediately, I guess, just goes and tucks his tail and he says, I'm going to ask Abram for all my stuff back and he doesn't deserve it. Right. Right. Um, keep going because I don't have my thoughts straight on this yet. Like I'm, no, I'm, you're fine. I'm tossing around with a couple of things. Yeah, no, you're fine. I mean, the thing about it is, is that he, at least he's got some boldness because we know that this guy, he's got quite a, a nasty city that's going to pop up a little bit later. But the right. one thing that he wants, whenever he gets back, he's like, he's, I don't even care about my stuff. I just want my people. Like I need my people. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's kind of almost just, it's funny because if Abram might've kept that stuff, there's going to be a variety of different things that are probably mixed with it. There's probably idols. There's probably all sorts of things that could have gotten Abram's way. Like we just saw him leave Egypt um, with all this wealth and abundance. Um, mm -hmm. Instead of just like saying, yeah, I don't want your stuff. You take it all back. So I don't know. It's just really unique that even though the king of Sodom didn't deserve anything, I mean, mm -hmm. he got his butt whipped. He honestly, every, all of his stuff really at this point in time would have belonged to Abram. Uh, but yeah. he just has the boldness to say, give it all back to me. Yeah. And, and again, uh, just to reiterate what you were just saying, it, it, you have um, several different contrasts, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those contrasts are uh, good and evil uh, right and wrong, uh, the motives and all of this kind of stuff. And so, um, when, when you have these kinds of contrasts like this, it's interesting to see like where it ends up. Um, look at the bottom of verse 20 after Melchizedek's blessing. And this was kind of goes along with my third question was why did Abram give, uh, Melchizedek a 10th of everything? right? There was no Levitical system yet. We were still maybe 600 to a thousand years away from Moses starting Levitical priesthood, uh, at Sinai. Um, you know, we're, we're a long ways from any kind of law given to the Israelites on how to tithe. Why did Abram give a 10th of everything to Melchizedek? Yeah, I don't know, um, but it is kind of unique the way the fact that the king of Sodom, he, Abram doesn't just like make him completely whole. He recognizes mm -hmm. that there's other people with him that need to be blessed by what the Lord is doing. So he honestly yeah. sacrifices, Abram sacrifices his own portion and gives that up. Um, so I don't even know if, I mean, this, I think that you're talking about a really good thing there with like the Levitical law and a, and a tenth going to the priests, but he also right. at the end of it blesses uh, the men who are with him saying, let them have their food. And then Aner, Eshkol and Mamre, they're going to take their share as well. Um, mm -hmm. So he really is just living out that bless everyone around you. Don't, and I'll take care of you. Just, just do the only job I want you to do is to bless those around you. And that might be a super relevant thing, you know, for us today. And right. it's, it's kind of one of those things that we probably don't do a great job of living out. Like we all work and we all get a paycheck and stuff like that. Um, but honestly, what Abram is trying is going through right now is he just got, you know, the biggest bonus of his life. Yeah, and the Lord yeah. and he's like the Lord just pretty much says he doesn't say anything. He doesn't tell him to give it away, but he trusts mm -hmm. God so much that he says, if I just bless those around me, I don't really need to worry about the rest of it. So I'll just well, give it all question, back. To you. Right, and the and again, you were talking about the contrast between the different things that are happening, and you brought up the contrast of Abram came out of Egypt and he was really really rich and he got rich off the world system. And when uh, he got back from rescuing Lot, again, he has lots and lots of wealth and riches. 
Um, and so he gives a tenth to Melchizedek. And so the question I had was, why did Abram give a tenth? And I think it's a question that should resonate with all of us. Why do any of us give a tenth to God? Most people would probably answer because uh, we are commanded to do that. Um, you know, we've heard our pastors preach about it, that we have to pay our tithe and give our offerings to the church. Um, but that doesn't really resonate with the question, why do we give? And I think that when when I see Abram giving in this capacity, what I am sensing is uh, kind of maybe an example of why we all should give. Because for Abram, his giving is saying, listen, it's not about me. I didn't yeah. do this. God did this. I can't do it on my own. Only with God can I do this. And so in the same way, when we give, um, it should be natural for us to give that tenth back to God, uh, no matter how you choose to give it. Some people would argue you should only ever give to the church. Uh, I kind of personally believe you should have a heart of generosity to give whenever the Lord leads you to give. But it is this, uh, when, when we give in this kind of capacity, it is making a statement and it's posturing our hearts to say, the things that I have received, I've not received on my own, but God has the one that has provided it for me. And I am giving it back in a way to recognize uh, and in my own heart that God is the source of everything that I receive. Yeah. And the other part about it is, I mean, he doesn't specifically... This, this really, after we just kind of started talking about it and unpacking it a little bit more, this just really ties in well with Genesis chapter 8, verses 20, or verse 20. And it says that Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is right after he got off the boat from the flood and took some yeah. of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered a burnt offering to the Lord. And when the Lord smelled it, the pleasing aroma in his heart said, I will never curse the ground because of man and the intentions of a man's heart are evil from his youth. So what we really are honestly seeing right here is that there's two, two different things coming to life right now. We give not just out of the fact that, um, you know, we're told to, we're give out, given out of the fact that it was given to us in the first place. Abram only had all of this stuff that he just got back from the king of Sodom. Because mm -hmm. the Lord said, you know, you and your 300 men can go beat this army of 10,000. I don't know what the number is, but that's just probably a huge astronomical difference. You know, Noah only had those clean animals because the Lord told him to load them up on the boat. So right. If, right. if we actually set back and we look at our stuff in our own life and we can just start seeing God and every little part of it, we can start participating a little bit more in this story. You know, I honestly like to sit here and think, you know, if we start looking at that a little bit better, we can let our hearts be transformed as Christians today mm -hmm. and recognize the fact that there is so much more going on in this story that needs to do work on our hearts. Because we honestly see that tenth and say, you know, we give out of obligation as opposed to the fact that we should be giving because God gave it to us all in the first place. And Abram got yeah. that. He got it right here in this story. Yeah. Well, it, it goes on to um, verse 21. It says, Then the king of Sodom, whose name was Berah, who is the son of evil, uh, said, to the, said to Abram, Give me the people, but take the possessions for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to the Lord God Most High, uh, creator of heaven and earth, and that I will not take a thread or a single strap or anything that belongs to you so that you will never say, I made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the servants have eaten. But as for the shares of the men who came with me, uh, Aner, uh, Eshkel, and Mamre, they can take their share. But I'm not taking anything. What's interesting here is when did Abraham make this oath to the Lord? And uh, when did he have this conversation with God that he was yeah. going to take nothing? We don't, we don't see it in, in our text. Uh, so it was obviously something happened while he was on that 400-mile round-trip journey and saving his uh, nephew. Uh, but 
it all just fits back together. Like, Abram has found the place in his heart where the Lord God is enough for him. He does not need more money. He does not need more servants. He does mm-hmm. not need any of this. And he definitely doesn't need the son of evil sitting there telling the rest of the world, oh, I made Abram rich. I'm the one who gave him all that plunder. He's like, no way, no way. You can have it all. The guys that came with me, they can have their share, but you're not going to say a thing about me because this stuff that you have to offer does not fulfill me. The Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, he is the one that is my fulfillment. That's right. That's good. I love it. And, you know, there's also one other thing to unpack with a lot of this as well, is that um, Abram gave the people back. Abram Mm -hmm. gave everything back. And in the middle of this, there was one person that was very important to Abram that was with the king of Sodom, somebody that had moved and assimilated into the culture of Sodom. And that was Abram's own, I guess, Bahor or uh, really an inheritor at that time, uh, Lot, yeah, the, the oldest male besides Abram in his household. Mm-hmm. And what Abram had recognized also at this point in time prior to the story, one of the things we talked about was that he knew that if his if his line were to continue, it's probably going to have to go through Lot. So there's honestly, he might as well be sitting there saying, you know, I finally got Lot back. I can take care of him. But the thing that he does, he trusts the Lord so much that he gives him up and says, you know what? The Lord's going to take care of him out of abundance. But also I think we see just a little bit more about Abram's character unfolding at this point in time too, because he says, if I give Lot back, and he doesn't have anything. He can't like if the, the, the king of Sodom doesn't have anything, it's probably as well going to make a pretty bad life for Lot. I don't know. It, it, it's one of those things. It's like, do you ever stop yourself from giving to, uh, you know, maybe a, a foreign country or something like some sort of like disaster relief fund uh, just because you don't like their political stance or whoever's in charge? I mean, maybe it's like you have. I don't know, uh, Iraq and you know, Mm -hmm. you don't, you're not, you're not really a big fan of their leadership over there and they have a disaster, but you don't give to it. You know, people will at the, the the stake of that are going to be the people on the bottom are going to get crushed. So I think Abram also sits there and says, not only do I not want it, but I know that with your wicked heart, that if I don't give, you're not going, these people right here, are going to be taken advantage of and abused. All these people I'm about to get back to you. Uh, because I, I would assume that the the son of evil being, uh, you know, the king of Sodom, he probably wanted those people back because he was about to put them to some good work to make sure that he could get his kingdom built back up. Right, I don't know. yeah, because if, if getting uh, taken into exile like that, I'm pretty sure they probably destroyed those cities pretty well. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, maybe they just went in and plundered them. Um, I don't know if, if we see anything that leads us to believe that they they put every building down to a pile of rocks and rubble. Um, so maybe there wasn't that much uh, that was happening. Maybe they just took the people and took the plunder and left. They're like, oh, that was easy. Well, it even says, I guess in, in verse 12, uh, they took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went on their way. So, yeah. I guess, I mean, it wasn't necessarily destroyed, they, but there was definitely some sort of economic crisis going on in Saddam at this point in time. So, uh, the what what I guess we're, I was trying to go with that is that not only does Abram sit there and give it all back to the king of Saddam, I think he's also doing out of a generous heart as well, understanding that if I let you take your people back, your people mm-hmm. are probably about to be at the boot of your evil empire, uh, you know, your destruction. And I need to give to you so you can have, so there can at least be some sort of stability for your people as well. 
But yeah. I just I think it's also really important before going into the next story that we recognize that Abram for the second time has given Lot up. So he'd already given him up once whenever he told him to go settle wherever he wanted and take the nicest land. Now he's given him up and saying that I just have to trust God. So I think Abram's heart is it's in a new place. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that's what's incredible about this story because we read this, uh, this tail end of 14, and it's it's easy for us to want to fixate on Melchizedek because, again, he's this guy that is shrouded in mystery. And, um, you know, from the New Testament perspective, we have a little bit more light shed on him. Uh, but even his mentioning, uh, the mentioning of Melchizedek in the New Testament authors is more about Jesus than it is about Melchizedek. And so when we read this story and keep our focus on Abram, we are beginning to understand that he has gone, That let me say this this way, that God has led him through a transformation where his heart and his faith is in a place where God can finally begin doing something or doing the thing with him not just something, but doing the thing with him that he has promised that he was always going to do. That's right. And uh, it also just shows that I think a good level setting for us in this story right here is that we've seen a lot of growth with Abram. And wherever you're at in your story, you can get to that same level of growth as well. If you just trust yeah. it, trust God's good and he's got abundance for you. That's so good. Yeah. Well, I got to go get ready to pick up a daughter from youth group. So we better call this a night. That sounds good, brother. Uh, well, thanks for all who joined with us. Uh, glad we yeah, could do a live so stream. Yeah. Five one of the or six to, people at a time. Yeah. We're going to have to start scheduling it, letting people know. Yeah. That'll be good. Yeah. We learn a little bit along the way. So, hey, if you were joining us this evening, thank you again for joining us. Um, we want to hear from you. If you have any feedback, let us know. Uh, Nick, I noticed a little bit on, I see the Facebook feed here, and I have the YouTube feed down here. Uh, the Facebook feed uh, freezes up more. The YouTube feed looks great. So I'm not sure why that is like that, but um, maybe we'll get that figured know. out. Thanks for bearing with us while we do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Hey, thanks again for joining us. This is the Jude 23 Community Podcast. Uh, it's a podcast for, no, I'm sorry, it's clarity for those who are curious or confused about all things Christian. I'm Jeremiah, along with Nick Cardcastle, and this was episode 18. We'll see you again next time.